Good afternoon. It is noon, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us for Happy, Healthy, and Autistic, a webinar presented by Dr. Angela Marks and co-hosted by the Autism Society of Greater Wisconsin and Mental Health America Lakeshore. I'm Kirsten Cooper, Executive Director of the Autism Society of Greater Wisconsin, and I'm happy to have the opportunity to welcome you to the event. Um, the Autism Society of Greater Wisconsin creates connections, empowering everyone in the autism community with the resources needed to live fully. We're one of three Autism Society affiliates serving the state of Wisconsin, and we serve the northern 53 counties in Wisconsin through education, support, advocacy, information and referral, and community building. If you're interested in learning more about the intersection of autism and mental health, we offer a six hour introductory virtual training on autistic mental health and well being. And we also have a more comprehensive 30 hour virtual training specifically for clinicians that work with autistic clients or those who want to work with autistic clients. And with grant funding from Wisconsin's Department of Health Services, we'll be opening up these trainings for free later this spring. Um, I'll put the links to those trainings in the chat and um, along with my email address. And I welcome you to email me if you're interested in joining an interest list to stay updated on those trainings. We have a lot of other great in-person and virtual events this spring. So if you're interested in learning more about the Autism Society, please visit our website. We'd love to connect with you. Thank you again for joining us. And with that, I'll pass it over to Dana from Mental Health America Lakeshore. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Dana Bear. I'm the Director of Strategy and Partnerships at Mental Health America Lakeshore. Uh, Mental Health America Lakeshore is a regional affiliate of the national organization, Mental Health America. We provide the most up-to-date knowledge and resources from across the country while connecting community members with the best local support, education, and training on mental health. We've served this community for over 70 years, and our mission is to promote overall mental health through education, support, public health reform, and advocacy. We hold a vision to create mentally healthy communities where all individuals can thrive. We work directly with schools, community organizations, and businesses to educate about mental health, emotional wellness, and we work to reduce the stigma that prevents individuals from seeking and receiving the care they need and deserve. We are so excited to have partnered with the Autism Society of Greater Wisconsin to bring Dr. Angela Marks online here today for this webinar. Dr. Marks is the founder of Place of Mind, which specializes in assessment and mental health, wellness, and healing with neurodivergent individuals to help them discover and define who they are and find or create the places where they belong and flourish. Dr. Angela Marks is a neurodivergent licensed psychologist who has been joining children, adolescents, adults, and families in various roles and places for the past 18 years. Although she uses research and scientific knowledge, she relies more heavily on each person's experience to join and learn with them. And with that, I will hand it off to Dr. Marks. All right, thank you both and welcome everybody. Uh, it's great that you are choosing to spend your lunch hour with me. I really appreciate it. I wanna put a couple caveats out there about my space before I start because you might see some things. Um, I live in a very old uh, farmhouse and this room for whatever reason has windows that attract these beetle things that somehow get in. So I tried to take care of them all, but if you, <laughs> if you see me moving, it's because uh, some of those bugs might be flying at me. So it will all be good. I'm used to it, but I just put that caveat out there. Uh, about my space as well as this is my home office. Um, so I do as much as possible to make it as uh, quiet as possible here, but I have animals and dogs and stuff too. So hopefully they're all gonna be quiet for us for this next hour here. Um, so that's about my space. Let's talk about uh, what to expect for today. Um, so I am going to be sharing, um, trying to share a lot of information with you today. Uh, some of it may be new, some of it may be very different from what you have been taught, what you currently think, what you know in regards to autistic people and autism. So I would just encourage you to just listen, uh, be open, take notes if you want. You will get, um, I will provide a copy of this PowerPoint um, that you will get as well as a copy of the recording too for people who signed up. 
Uh, so I'll provide this PowerPoint. There is so much information in this PowerPoint that I will not even get to it all today and all the resources. Um, so you'll see it's jam packed with links, with things like that. Uh, so I'm just starting to kind of scratch the surface at some of this stuff today in our limited time together. But I strongly encourage you to check out uh, some of the other information that you will get um, on these slides today as well, as well as my contact information is going to be on the last slide of this PowerPoint. Um, so feel free to reach out to me, email me, um, reach out to me and connect with me if you have any questions or anything uh, kind of brewing for you uh, today as you're listening to this information. Um, so I think that's the main introductory points. Uh, you'll see today I will have lots of different graphics, lots of different links. These are from actually autistic people, scholars, professionals, lots of stuff to look through, lots of videos that I'm not gonna play today, but I have included. So it will be um, lots of information. Um, so we'll just kind of start in on it today. So again, thank you for being here. We'll, we'll move forward. So before I get too much into, um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I just wanna share a little bit about kind of my lens. I think it is important to recognize um, kind of the information we get from people and how they're, where they're coming at it from. So I'm gonna be as transparent as possible about my own lens and my own practice and my own view of, um, autistic people, autism, neurodiversity. Um, so as already stated, I am a neurodivergent psychologist. So I identify as an autistic adhd -er myself um, and have been for all my life. <laughs> so that's what I'm bringing into it, not only personal experience, um, but uh, all the people uh, that I join with in a uh, professional sense are neurodivergent as well. Um, so I have a practice with myself and three other clinicians, and we serve the state of Wisconsin with a really specific focus on that intersection of disability and long-term care systems and the mental health systems, which are both separate systems, unfortunately, at this point in time. So we like to say we try to exist in that gap, um, that unfortunate gap. Um, so really what I seek to do is demedicalize this stuff, although I am a clinician, um, I try to share and pre present information in a way that's not clinically, um, uh, clinical jargon and all of that. So demedicalize, kind of decentralize um, and individualize health and wellness, which really focuses on, we focus a lot on accessibility, inclusion for all brains and bodies. Um, and I'm coming at you from my home office, as I shared, because all the work that we do is in the community with people. Uh, so we don't have uh, offices, we don't have locations that people come to. I literally am going out and meeting with people in their places as well. Um, and that's what we do as a, um, a practice as well. So that's kind of the lens that I'm coming at you from today. Um, just a little bit more information about my lens and kind of how I think about things and experience things myself. Um, I will go into much more of this information today as well, but I just want to be, again, pretty transparent transparent, and upfront with kind of my, my lens and my view. Um, so um, this actually is from a um, survey that was a worldwide survey that was done um, uh, with around 2,000 people, actually a little bit over 2,000 people who um, are identified um, as autistic or self-identified as autistic. Um, and you'll see here, um, kind of in my belief, is that people like being autistic. Um, I like being autistic. Um, it doesn't mean it doesn't come with uh, difficulty and disability, um, but that is not because of autism. So I'll talk more about that. So I like to start with this because not only is it my experience and my belief um, and kind of overall assumption, again, it doesn't mean everything about it is um, easy or glorious or wonderful, right? Uh, but overall, it's um, people like being autistic. Um, so we'll talk about different views that might not be a common view that um, a lot of people have. Uh, and we'll talk about why that is too. 
And then the other piece, so the yes column is kind of the column that I am in. So um, that's kind of why I said no and yes here. So, um, and again, I'll talk more about this, but I do not come from the belief that autistic people need to be treated, fixed, cured, figured out so they can be normal, right? Um, I come from this viewpoint um, and really the support and practices that I do is coming from this sense that autistic people um, don't need to be fixed. They are whole human beings. And what they really need is respect, support, and accommodation so they can be thriving and still be autistic, right? So you can be happy, healthy, and autistic. It's not a one or the other. Um, and also we'll talk about some common misconceptions. I'll do some myth busting um, throughout this presentation as well. I'll infuse it in different ways. But this belief, uh, it's a common belief that autistic people are in their own world. Um, and that actually is not true. <laughs> uh, although it may appear that way to some people on the surface, but it is absolutely true that autistic people experience the world differently. And we'll talk more about that. Um, and I am, uh, there's a reason why I'm sharing information today and the information that I've chosen to share today coming from the actually autistic community. So autistic people themselves, uh, people with lived experiences, professionals, scholars who are actually autistic themselves uh, versus the autism community, uh, which is made up of largely non-autistic people. Um, again, it's not better or worse than, it's just different. Um, so I'm trying to be as transparent as where I'm coming at you from today. So the autism community, meaning parents, professionals, people who are not autistic themselves. Um, and really, um, this month uh, specifically is, is not a not a lot of autistic people like this month, even though it's technically supposed to be for autistic people. Uh, but so Autism Awareness Month, which is this month, um, is really um, developed from Autism Speaks and this idea that, again, uh, it's something to be pathologized, to be cured, to be treated. And this puzzle piece, meaning uh, you have to be like it's somebody that has to be figured out or we have to figure out this puzzling person that's kind of missing a piece uh, versus this idea of autism acceptance saying the person is a whole person. Even if we don't completely understand that person, they aren't a puzzle, they aren't missing a piece. There's not a piece that needs to be fixed or even figured out, but coming from a place of acceptance and understanding. Um, so that is the lens, like I said, I'm trying to be as transparent while still maybe providing some new information for people. Uh, many autistic people do not like the puzzle piece. I know it's all over the place. I have a link here that talks more about that. Um, and um, Autism Speaks as well, um, I know is a, a big resource out there. Many actually autistic people also, um, that is not something that they necessarily align with either. So. That's the yes column is more of a yes as to this is where I'm, this is the column that I'm in right now and where I'm coming at you from today. So I'm going to do some myth busting, like I said. Um, and so this is a big thing that is still um, a piece of what many people think and what actually is out there in the medical literature, all of that is that autism is a disorder. It's a condition, it's a disability, it's a difficulty, um, when in reality, um, not quite. <laughs> so what autism actually is, it is in the, in the sense of the word, it is a neurological classification, right? So autism itself is not a thing. It's not a condition. It is a descriptor of a set of traits that a person has. Um, so I think that's really important to know because it's not the same as a, you know, very specific medical condition that somebody might have um, that can be, you know, maybe tested with a blood test or an x-ray or whatever it might be. That's not how this diagnosis and identifier works, right? So it is strictly a classification of a set of symptoms, a, a set of traits that sometimes people call symptoms. Um, so that is what autism in its like purest sense is. It is a set of traits, okay? Um, that can cause difficulty, disability, 
contribute to that, but it is not any of those things in and of itself. It's simply a descriptor. It's a word used to describe traits. It's really important. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about history of this uh, this descriptor, right? So it originally uh, was a descriptor that assumed it was a medical condition. It was a discovery, it was a condition, it was a new discovered condition, a disorder, it was a tragedy, um, in that uh, it's really based on this assumption that there's one right way to be, to develop, and that if you deviate from that, it needs to be treated or fixed. So the assumption is like it's a failed, and I'll talk about neurodiversity and the, these terms in just a second here, kind of a failed neurotypical person is kind of how it has, that's, that's the history of it. So because of that, today, we are still bombarded with information about all the deficits associated with it. Um, deficits and in social interaction, right? Deficits in communication, deficits in sensory processing, and restricted and repetitive behaviors. But as hopefully you will uh, start to discover and get information about today, is that this information is based on a lot of um, limited information, first off, based on a lot of flawed assumptions that we now know more about today, and really this ableist view, which we will talk about ableism today as well briefly. Any of these alone could be its own hour or even more presentation, but I'll try to touch on pieces of it today, more for uh, just increasing awareness and view on some of this too. So that's the history of it. So kind of where have things shifted since then? So again, neurodiversity is not a new concept in and of itself. However, the term is being um, more widely used and recognized. So at its sense, again, neurodiversity is a biological fact. It is just like biodiversity, which says there are all sorts of beings in the, in the world, in the environment that are necessary for the world to keep existing. Um, is the same with neurodiversity, but it's talking about brains specifically. So it is a biological fact that no two brains are exactly alike, right? Like that is just, it, it's not possible. Uh, so that's essentially what neurodiversity is saying, is that all brains are different. Um, so neurodiversity affirmative, which I'm going to talk about today, or more the diversity affirmative stance, is that um, unlike the ableist stance, which says one type of brain or being or existing is better than the other or superior, the neurodiversity aspect of it is recognizing that diversity of brains and recognizing that all beings and brains are valuable, okay? That not one is not better than the other just because they may look very different. So you'll hear me using some terms, terms today that I wanna clarify as well. So neurodiversity refers to a group. No single person can be neurodiverse. Neurodiversity is talking about a group of brains, a group of people. Um, so when we talk about a single person, it is either neurotypical or neurodivergent, right? So neurotypical is essentially gonna mean the neuro majority. That just means more people um, have that specific, whatever it may be in society, right? So that's more neurotypical. Neurodivergent is going to be the neuro minority, which essentially just means there are less people. Um, usually things get diagnosed when you fall outside of that majority, right? Uh, but from this neurodiversity perspective, um, that it is just less, it just means less, less of less people have that trait, whatever it may be, or that combination of traits. So autism itself is a type of neurodivergence, okay? So you'll hear me, um, I've already used, you may have already noticed some of the language I'm using today, which is very purposeful and intentional as well. Uh, this idea that autism is not a bad word. So I use identity first language. Um, I talk about people and use, utilize autism as a descriptor, um, as the same as I would any other descriptor. Um, so autistic, just like, you know, I wouldn't say I'm a person with femaleness, right? I'm a female. So any other trait that people naturally don't um, think is bad, 
they use identity first language. So person first language, actually what it was intended to do uh, is doing the opposite. It's pathologizing autism. It's saying, well, it can't be, you know, it's gotta be outside of the person. And in doing that, it is um, actually pathologizing or giving the impression that it is something bad. Um, so you're gonna hear me use autistic. Um, if a person themselves has a different preference, I will obviously absolutely respect that preference. Mostly I use people's names, um, but if we're talking about using this as a descriptor, my, as a professional, I am not wanting to pathologize people. Um, just, so I use identity first language as my default. You're also noticing I'm not talking about it as ASD. I'm not talking about it as autism spectrum disorder, right? Because it's not, um, it's not a disorder in and of itself. Um, and then uh, you're also not going to hear me use functioning labels. Well, I'll, you know, it might be clear why. Um, so high functioning, low functioning, those types of things are also based on very ableist assumptions uh, that are actually not really helpful um, in describing or referring to people at all. And then you'll hear me use disabled as a verb as well. So just like autism is not a bad word, disability and di disabled is not a bad word either. Um, so I subscribe to the social model of disability, which says, um, disability does not exist within the person itself. It is in the interaction with the person and the environment. So it is, I use it as a verb and it is not a bad thing. Um, again, doesn't always make things, it doesn't always mean it's, it's you know, wonderful by any means or makes things easier, but it is not, that word in itself is not a bad word. So that's what you'll hear me maybe using this language. It might be different than what you you have been trained to do or use, um, but uh, again, just using it as an opportunity to talk about why those things are the way they are as well and why I'm using that. Um, so here's another kind of piece here. So a lot of people think, talk about autism as a spectrum, right? Um, so, and typically when they're talking about it, um, this is where high and low functioning usually come in for people, um, is that it's either you're less autistic or if you fall over here, you're way more autistic, right? Which the spectrum does not work like that when you think about autism and really the experience of autistic people. It doesn't look like this linear spectrum that goes from, okay, one side is you know way less autistic and the other side is way more autistic. Um, autism is autism although it looks and presents differently for every single autistic human being, there are some commonalities, which we will talk about today, uh, but it's really important to recognize, I talk about the spectrum as this, um, right? That because autism is an invisible and dynamic, it's invisible and dynamic, right? So what that means is you can't tell just by looking at somebody, you can't tell just by looking at and observing their behaviors, because that's not how it works. <laughs> um, so, but that's how it's typically labeled, right? It's typically labeled by how behaviors are presented outwardly to other people and identified as either being, you know, normal or abnormal or whatever, you know, those descriptors are. But that's, again, very misleading uh, because you can't always tell what's going on with a person internally by just looking at them on the outside, right? And we'll talk about why that's especially true for neurodivergent and autistic people with a concept called masking. Um, so it's not a specific set of symptoms that collectively worsen and improve as you go from one end to the other. The truth is, is that it influences a person and presents outwardly in a number of ways, right? And it really also depends on the day. So it's a dynamic process. It's not always gonna look and feel and present and appear the same every day. That's the dynamic piece of it. Um, and when we think about how disability might interact with that, with the environment, it depends on so many things. It depends on the context, right? As to how those things are gonna um, influence a person and maybe show up for other people to notice or see as well. So autism is invisible. Autism is dynamic. It's not something that we can just tell and place labels on by viewing people as strictly a collection of behaviors that we can see or report on. So this is also one I've already talked about, but this idea that autistic people are in their own world, which is not true. Autistic people experience the world differently. And I'm gonna try to give a, 
a picture of that. Every autistic person is different and as to how this is influenced and what things are influencing this, but I'm gonna talk in general about kind of the autistic experience in regards to um, some of the commonalities there. So I will highly recommend to anybody and everybody, this is my go-to, the first resource. If you're gonna look at anything after today, please look at this. I provided it at the end in all the resources. I have about 10 slides of resources at the end of this slideshow as well. It's also linked here. Um, it is um, written and developed by actually autistic people themselves in trying to uh, describe um, what it's like to be autistic. So it's uh, understanding the autistic mind. So the information I'm gonna be talking about today is from that uh, with a, a kind of additional information uh, that I like to share about it too. Um, so highly recommend this resource. It is has so much great information in it. Um, so really the commonality um, is that autistic people have a sensitized nervous system. So what does that mean? Uh, that means that being able to um, filter and discriminate, discriminate stim stimuli, sorry, mouthful there, uh, both externally and internally is, uh, is not a choice. It's not within the, the control of the autistic person. So what that kind of can look like and how that presents is that we're not choosing which stimuli comes in and which ones we're gonna use and have to process for the day. Because of the sensitized nervous system, which is the brain and the body, we are getting information. It's not a choice. It's not that we can put up that filter or that block to not get that information. It's gonna impact us even if we're choosing it, signing up for it or not, right? So, and the important thing, the next step of that is that um, we can't ignore them. Like, so once they're there, it's gotta be processed. And the way each person needs to process that might depend again on the person, on the stimuli, whatever it may be, but you can't just ignore it. It is gonna make it worse. <laughs> it's actually uh, really unhelpful. Um, so processing it, letting it be processed the way it needs to be processed is the only way to get rid of that input because you can't filter it out, right? It's gotta be processed, it's gotta go through. So because of that redirection or trying to redirect is gonna make it worse. So things like let it go, oh, just ignore it. It's not a big deal. Those things are literally impossible uh, for autistic people when it comes to this piece. Right. So from the uh, the resource that I just shared, um, they, there's this quote in there that I have included here that they say tribalization is a privilege of minds that can filter stimuli. OK, so again, it's about the filtering. It's not a choice. It is because of that sensitized nervous system. It's just it's just going to come in. OK, so because of that, like I said, it. Um, it shows up in all sorts of different ways. So I'm gonna, oops, went way too fast there. Sorry, my computers, there we go. Um, so I'm gonna try to give an example of this real quickly here uh, without, uh, so if we think about like, for example, sitting down to eat a meal, right? Um, it may, so for somebody who is not autistic or who doesn't have that sensitized nervous system, they may be able to sit down and focus on the meal. They may notice some things in their environment, uh, but they're able to kind of focus on the meal. It's not as much of an attention thing, right? It's about filtering input. So they might, they might their nervous system and brain and body might be able to say, okay, like there are stinky shoes over there. I'm gonna, you know, try not to smell those or like, I'm not even gonna notice those. I'm not gonna pay attention to those. I don't even see those, right? Or, or, you know, thoughts in their own mind or uh, smells or just things that you're seeing or noticing, right? Those are all things that you can kind of catalog and choose which one you want to um, pay attention to. Not again for an attention, but which stimuli you're going to notice, right? For an autistic person, it doesn't come in that way. Uh, so although you may be sitting down to eat, 
it's it can be hard again it can depend on the context it could depend on lots of things but there can be all sorts of stimuli that other people aren't even noticing or taking in because they don't have that sensitized nervous system, right? So there may be all this other stuff, all these other thoughts, all these other senses, all these other um, sensory input that might be coming in. Um, and again, it's not a choice. It's not about like, oh, just pay attention to your meal. It is literally, no, those things are gonna influence me as I'm eating, no matter what, right? It's not about uh, not paying attention to those things. Um, so again, this shows up in all sorts of different ways. I've tried to give a, give a pretty concrete example here of what that might, the difference there. So I'm not gonna read this, uh, but these are again, every autistic person, this impacts them differently and in multiple ways, right? It's not just the one example I gave. So this is also from that resource that I provided about um, you know, just the world being too chaotic and saturated with stimuli for the mind to process. So how that can show up for people, how they how it can influence people are kind of the comments here that that different folks, autistic folks had shared. Um, so getting stuck, losing train of thought, um, you know, all of those things, being vulnerable. So it's just some direct quotes from people that I wanted to add here. If you uh, open up the resource, there's going to be more in there as well. Um, so another similar thought here is that autistic behaviors or symptoms are need to be gotten rid of, right? Those things are bad things. Those things are not desirable. Uh, so we need to get rid of them. Uh, when in reality, autistic behaviors do not exist. So I'll talk about why that is and what they actually are. And knowing that autism does not have a look, right? Like it's not something that, um, again, can be seen. It's not something that's just based off specific behaviors that are or aren't present. Autistic people look like regular people. OK, um, so there may be, um, you know, some things that are externalized that maybe can be seen, but those behaviors in and of themselves are not autistic behaviors. So what are they really? Um, so if you think about what I've talked about already, the world is designed for the majority, right? The majority, the world is designed for the neurotypical brain. Uh, because that's where more people fit. So it makes sense to design places for the majority, right? But because of that, many autistic people are fighting these unseen, so these invisible unseen battles every day, that combined with the stimuli that can exceed the capacity of the brain to process them, it can create distress. It can create stress or it can be the flip side and actually create a whole lot more joy because if we're feeling more stress stuff, we also feel things to more extreme when it comes to happiness and joy and all of that too. So these um, examples here that I provided are things everybody does. Uh, maybe just not as much, maybe just not as often, maybe just not as visibly, uh, but these are things that everyone shows. Okay, so if we consider the context, which we'll talk about a little bit more too, is they aren't autistic behaviors. These are behaviors that make sense if we understand the context, okay? Um, so I wanna talk about the stress piece of it uh, because that's usually what people focus on when they think about behaviors that might be concerning. So meltdown, shutdowns, and burnout. So the image here is about burnout. Um, but they're all kind of related here. So meltdowns and shutdowns, um, you know, everybody may have different aspects of them in their life because it's a stress response, right? Anytime our brains and bodies experience stress, it's that fight, flight, freeze response, right? Which is a meltdown or a shutdown. So because autistic people may experience that higher and more frequently, these also may look different, right? They may look different than um, but it's a stress response. Again, it's not a choice. And continued stress can also lead to burnout. Um, and without adjustments, um, autistic people live more than 50% of their life in burnout, okay? Um, and you maybe can see why, right? If you're taking in all that information and all that stimuli, um, it can be really stressful on the body, especially if you um, 
don't have supports and accommodations and intentions around some of that. And burnout can be temporary. It can last months. It can last years. It can be permanent for some people. So it's really important when we think about supporting autistic people that this is a priority. We want to prevent these things um, and also focus on health and wellness. But if we can prevent these things, it's going to go a long way to uh, facilitating health and mental health and wellness. So again, concerning behavior is not autistic behavior, right? It's not, that's, that's not what it is, it's stress, okay? So what might also contribute to stress here? So I've included these here, also links to these. So if you are um, curious or want to open up kind of your own lens to all the things that can stress uh, autistic people out, especially if you're not autistic yourself, it might be helpful to check these out because uh, stress is right in the in the brain and body of the beholder. So it's how the person experiences it. So just because it doesn't stress you out or somebody else out doesn't mean it's not a, a really big stressor for um, another person who has a very different brain and body. So again, these are just more examples of the things that are stressed. So there's this autism checklist of doom here, which has so many things on it. Um, and then another is from that same resource I've already recommended is 50 ways society gaslights and puts up barriers for autistic people. Again, just um, opening up just all the um, possibilities uh, that, you know, maybe haven't been considered, especially if, um, your brain and body are not um, autistic. I'm not gonna go into this too in depth for sake of time also today, but I also wanna just, um, so trauma informed, right, is a big thing. Um, and I think it's really important also to um, widen our lens on what might be trauma. Um, so this is, uh, and I put the link here, Kelly Mahler's uh, article here on neurodivergent trauma. So the things specifically that stress and traumatize neurodivergent people that might not be currently considered under some people's trauma, identification of trauma or stressors or that trauma-informed lens. So briefly, without going too in-depth, it's sensory, which I've already talked about, that sensory stimuli, social, compliance, neurological, and medical. So these are all... Um, places and sources of a lot of stress and trauma for neurodivergent people um, and not just autistic people, but autistic people definitely fit in this too. Um, so I encourage you to check that out. I, I, don't, I can't talk about stress <laughs> um, for autistic people without talking about ableism uh, because it is um, deeply ingrained in our society. Ableism um, is discrimination and prejudice against people with disabilities. Um, and this is, um, like I said, the default of our society. It's uh, more based on this idea about contempt. So seeing somebody as less than or deficient, not necessarily pure um, or like direct hatred, uh, but about that contempt, contempt. So seeing people as, like I talked about, defective, deficient, needing to be cured, needing to be fixed, that is ableism. Um, and it's all over, right? It's interpersonal, it's systemic, it's internalized, it's in the medical system, it's in the legal system, it's even in our language that we use. Um, so I do a whole thing around ableism and oppression and stigma. Um, so I'm going to try to keep this uh, just acknowledging it, uh, but there's, I'm not doing it justice, but having only one slide here. Um, but it's really, really important to um, have an awareness around because it is a contributes to stress in the way all autistic people um, live, even if they're not aware of it or we're not aware of it. It's everywhere. Um, so it's about awareness. It's about a lot of unlearning. It's deeply ingrained um, in a lot of our systems and our society. It's really easy to overlook and to just be like, well, that's just how things are. That's just how we've always done it. That's just the normal way to do it, uh, right? But um, yeah, there's there's lots of pieces tied into that. So one example of that even is, you know, this term I hear all the time of, you know, especially as kids are getting language, this idea of use your words, right? 
That in itself is ableist. It's the assumption that everybody uses spoken word to communicate, which is not true. And it's not the only way to communicate, right? So that is just one example. I could probably give hundreds of examples here, uh, but that's just an example that I show to just show how um, ingrained it is into just typical phrases and things people use. It's not even necessarily these big, um, direct discriminatory practices that are ableist. So, okay, so I just put here again, um, another kind of image there about uh, common things autistic people hear, um, but are ableist and really not helpful at all. Um, again, I'm not going to read this word for word, but you can't talk about ableism without talking about privilege as well. Um, so neurotypical privi privilege is, you know, um, the, the majority, right? It's that kind of majority privilege um, that um, often the neuro minority, which is neurodivergent folks, are having to strive and do all the learning and do all the work and um, kind of not meeting people halfway there. Um, so this is Nick Walker, another great resource here. Uh, I encourage you to check out not only that link, uh, but the site has tons of great stuff. It's also one of my core things that I provide to people in regards to describing autism. Um, so one example of this neurotypical privilege is this idea about social skills, right? Um, we now know uh, more about this, if you haven't heard of the double empathy problem, um, I'll, I'll speak a little bit to it. There's also resources here that I have provided for it as well. But um, we now know, and research, if you're a researcher, um, has even showed this too, uh, that social deficits are not actually uh, because of autism, and they aren't because of uh, a person is autistic. The social deficits come in in both ways. So just as it is difficult for a non-autistic person to understand and communicate with an autistic person, it goes the same way. Um, because the majority are not autistic, it, the deficit is placed on the autistic person. When we know now, those social deficits go away uh, when people with like brains get together. So when autistic people get together, you don't see those social deficits anymore. Um, so it's not a true deficit, it's a difference, right? It's just like a kind of a cultural difference. If you go to a different culture and speak a different language, it doesn't mean that language is bad and the other language is better. It just means there's a difference there. So what the double empathy problem essentially says is the more dissimilar <laughs> or the more different our brains are with each other, the harder it's going to be to empathize and communicate and socialize, which makes sense, right? Uh, the more similar our brains are, uh, the easier it's going to be to empathize and communicate and socialize, right? So it's not about social skills. And I included this other um, piece here because uh, it's usually autistic people who are um, you know said to need the social skills right but if we're talking about it as meeting us halfway um, I include this social skills for neurotypical people so it's kind of flipping the script there as to if you want to communicate um, and meet an autistic person halfway these are things that um, that might be helpful to know or have um, if you're not autistic yourself. So again, it's the double empathy problem. Um, I provided resources here. I um, There's, like I said, research also that's supporting this now as well. So that's just one example. Um, so I wanted to talk about masking. Uh, if I can here just briefly too, I mentioned it, uh, but again, this is a common experience among autistic people. About 90% of autistic people mask, whether it be conscious or unconscious. Um, or intentional or unintentional, or just what they've had to do. Um, so uh, masking is, again, why you can't just tell if a person is autistic or not by looking at them. Uh, because masking is essentially, um, you know, showing or uh, masking kind of autistic traits or difficulties in order to not just fit in, uh, but to survive, right? Uh, so it's bigger than just to fit in. It's literally to just survive and exist. Autistic people have to mask. 
So although it can be protective, right, and really adaptive, it comes at a high cost. And you'll see the cost of masking here, as well as the link here um, that goes more in depth into that. So it comes at higher rates of depression, anxiety, social anxiety, higher rates of suicide, high masking autistic individuals are nine times more likely uh, to um, die by suicide. More frequent suicidal ideation, more frequent PTSD symptoms, shorter average lifespan. So it's about 36 years old for a high masking autistic person. Uh, it can result in misdiagnosis and missed diagnosis and significantly contributes to autistic burnout. It also increases a person's sense of self or increases their vulnerability and their sense of self, their self-awareness, their self-trust, their self-identity. Um, and then also suppressing traits, suppressing, suppressing things can lead to physical health difficulties as well. Um, so it's a important consideration. Like I said, it is um, can be conscious or unconscious. And it is for survival, not just to fit in, although it may serve that purpose at times for people too. So autism needs to be treated, right? That's another big thing that I hear. I don't do autism treatment uh, because I don't believe autistic people or autism needs to be treated. Uh, what autistic people really need, as I've mentioned before, respect, support, and accommodations so they can be healthy, happy, and still be autistic, right? Um, so it doesn't, again, discount this idea that differences, difficulties, and disability often come with being autistic, but that does not mean the person needs to be pathologized, treated, or changed. Um, they are still a whole person, even if they are autistic. Um, and you don't need to get rid of the autism to be happy and healthy. And because autism is just how a person's nervous system is designed, you can't really get rid of it. Um, so how do we think about doing this then? I talk about autistic thriving as having two big important pieces to it. One, we want to try as much as we can to prevent the things I've talked about, which really contribute to significant physical and mental health difficulties. Prevent masking, prevent stress and burnout. So if we can just do that, like I said, it uh, it will go a long way. But I also um, like to think about, okay, not just preventing things, but how do we also foster? So fostering genuine, so that a person can feel genuinely autistic and like their genuine self um, and still, you know, um, still be autistic and still be happy, healthy and healing. So because of this, um, all of the things that contribute to autistic stress, including ableism, um, healing-centered work. So there is a healing piece to this for all autistic people. Uh, so I say you can't do health without doing healing uh, when you're working with neurodivergent people, especially autistic people. Um, so all of these things are needed. We need to come from a place of understanding, which is what I'm hoping to help inform and then thinking about not treating, but how do we support and accommodate people? Um, and then uh, this healing centered work too. So it's all three of those are what's involved in uh, promoting health and wellness, uh, mental and physical. So how do we think about doing that? I'm, I provided a lot here. I know we have uh, not a whole lot of time left, so hopefully I can get through a lot of them without uh, overwhelming too much with information here. But because autistic people experience the world differently, right? Um, we need to first understand the autistic person. So we have to understand them. We have to understand their unique brain, body, and context before we decide to do anything, right? Um, so we're not going to focus on changing behaviors, replacing behaviors, getting rid of behaviors, because in fact, a lot of behaviors that are termed autistic behaviors serve a very important helpful purpose for autistic people. So we do not want to get rid of them. That's actually going to further stress and contribute to mental and physical health difficulties. So we have to first seek, come from a place of curiosity and understanding. How can we learn about this person and understand them 
before we get into anything, right? Um, so, because if we don't, if we aren't aware, if we're not coming from that place of understanding, if we're putting our own biases, interpretations, ableism, um, our own brain and body, especially if we are not autistic, we are going to stress. Even the best of intentions, it's going to stress and further oppress, right? So that awareness, that seeking to understand is the first piece here. It's a critical piece uh, to uh, really supporting um, autistic people. So what that looks like, I call it at my practice from evidence-based to empathy-based. Um, so it's also been referred to as kind of this neurodiversity affirmative. Again, this idea that no brain and body is superior to others. We all have important things to contribute um, and uh, we are all valuable the way we are. Um, so I talk about it, um, yeah, as being empathy-based. So it doesn't mean we don't use any evidence-based stuff, but evidence-based practices, what are they, right? They are typically practices that are intended and designed to be used with every single person the same way. Typically, those are neurotypical people, right? It's the majority. So the goal of evidence-based practice is to find something that's gonna work for the majority of people. Because autistic people are not in the majority, evidence-based practices might not be helpful. They might actually be harmful. Um, and even if well-intended, right? So it doesn't mean the autistic person is failing at the treatment or at the practice, but that it actually is not designed for their brain and body and unique way of being in the world. Um, so I talk about it as empathy-based. We use a lot of evidence-based practices in our practice, but we definitely tailor them um, to each unique person and their unique brain and body and context. So these are just different ways uh, that I have included here about how you can do that. Um, presume competence, ask permission, uh, never violating bodily autonomy. So uh, never forcing a person to move, to be in any sort of way, honoring everybody's processing needs, preventing that overload, support based on a person's unique brain and body, Seek to understand. This is a big one. Seek to understand, not solve, not fix, not convince, not cure. Partner instead of parent. Um, even with kids, <laughs> right? We're going to partner with them. We're going to see them as human beings that are worthy of uh, respect and consideration no matter what age, okay? So that is empathy-based. Um, also, if you're looking for other kind of words out there as to how this, uh, if you're interested in learning more about a different way of supporting folks, neurodiversity affirmative is another uh, kind of, it's a label for this type of approach. So again, recognizing that people can be happy, healthy, and autistic, even if the way they do that, the way that they have uh, thrive and kind of uh, exist in a healthy way is not the same or might be unrecognizable, especially to non-autistic people. The goal of anything, therapy or otherwise, should not be to normalize people uh, because that leads to further oppression and that it's a large piece of what I see as mental health difficulties in my practice are significantly, the, a significant contributor to them is unsupported, unidentified, unaccepted neurodivergence that actually creates and significantly and or significantly contributes to the mental health difficulties that are coming up, okay? So really important. Um, so I also wanna just take a second to talk about what's not neurodiversity affirmative before I give a few more examples of this neurodiversity affirmative um, um, approach. So these things are not neurodiversity affirmative. Again, anything that's about eliminating behaviors or gaining compliance or doing things in a specific way. So behavioral training, compliance-based training that's only focused on a behavioral way of existing that doesn't first understand that behavior and what it means to the person in their own brain, body, and context. Autism training, autism interventions, social skills training, social skills interventions. Um, so I've put more links here 
um, into that, um, as well as a graphic from uh, Therapist Neurodiversity Collective uh, that has lots of different resources on uh, the difference between uh, neurodiversity affirmative and other things that are not as affirmative in that way. So again, on some other, if you're a researcher, these are more like data and research in that way, more scientific research. Here's a couple other uh, articles uh, that are kind of saying that same thing. So being able to pass for neurotypical is not a positive outcome when it comes to um, autistic mental health and wellness. Um, it may be to other people uh, who are, uh, but it's not positive for the, the person. When disability is defined by behavior, outcome measures should not promote passing, okay? So again, other, um, depending on your own unique brain, uh, just different resources for this if you're interested in diving deeper into some of these things. Um, so again, this is lots of words, but I felt it was important to include these exact words uh, because these are uh, neurodiversity affirmative assumptions, which I've already talked about uh, most of them already. Uh, so neurodivergent people are inherently worthy of dignity and acceptance and deserve to flourish in their community as their most autistic authentic or autistic selves, if we're talking about autism. The goal should not be to help them adjust to normative social systems, but to dismantle the ways in which those systems conditions or conditions are oppressive and create barriers to desired participation. Neurodivergent people have the right to self-determination and self-advocacy. They have the right to define what good outcomes or what health or what quality of life means for them. Um, we have to consider the intersection as of not only trauma, but of also other lived experiences and oppression, uh, experiences of oppression that autistic people have. Um, the neurology of neurodivergent people may produce differences in behavior again, communication, expression, but that these are equally valued, equally respected. Um, and that neurodivergence is a different, not lesser way of being, okay? So this, again, I provided the, the um, citation here that this came from another great kind of uh, resource that is a, a academic article as well. So again, when we think about supporting just in our last few minutes here, I think about these things as not autistic behaviors that we need to get rid of or replace, but these are autistic tools that are actually helpful for people. So we want to first listen, even with more than our ears, so not just with, what's, with spoken words. Spend time with people without an agenda. Seek to, when if you're ever unsure, seek to understand more. So here's just a few examples here that are typically thought of as things that we have to get rid of. These are kind of those restricted repetitive behaviors um, when actually those really serve a purpose for people. Uh, so we don't want to get rid of them. They actually are what's keeping autistic people grounded and regulated. So we want to recognize and respect those routines, those rituals, okay? We want to recognize and respect special interests. Uh, so those are, again, uh, you know, individualized, but they are what's meaningful to the individual, brings joy. Um, so we want to respect those. We want to actually uh, carve out time for those for autistic people. They're necessary. It's not a hobby. It's literally necessary for an autistic person's health and wellness. It's part of their identity. Stimming um, serves an important purpose as well. This is any repetitive vocalization, movement, activity. Again, for all humans, repetition is soothing. Right, so stimming could be serving that purpose for an autistic person. It could help with soothing, with regulation, with focus. Sometimes it's just to release energy. Sometimes it's a way to communicate. Um, and sometimes it's just fun. Um, so I say just keep stimming. That's not something we want to um, disregard or try to change in people just because it looks different, just because it might be a different way of regulating or moving the body. Again, a couple, there's no right way again here. So just a couple more examples here. There's no right way to communicate. So here again, this idea of functional communication has to look a certain way. Another great resource here, the AAC coach um, has lots of stuff on communication. 
Um, so functional communication is not just speaking with words and listening with your ears, right? That communication is way more than that, or even listening with eye contact. Similarly, there's no right way to play. Uh, so parallel play, lining things up, all of those things are still play. Those are valid. Those are play. We don't have to teach children or anybody how to play. It is what people do naturally. And then there's no right way to love. Um, so some people may have heard of the love languages. Um, so these are kind of an autistic take on the love languages, uh, which I just, again, include here just to show all the different ways that um, just because it looks different, it's still connection, it's still love. Um, so I won't go over them all because we're just at our time here, I see, but they are all here. Parallel play, info dumping, supportive reminders, and penguin peddling. So if you're not familiar with them, check it out, even Google autistic love languages, and you'll see those. So thank you so much. I have a lot of resources here. I'm, I'm going to try to breeze through them just to show you. And then thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We will um, send out the recording of this to all the individuals that registered.